Rod Mesa coming here. Don't let your lack of success be the death of your fishing. Check out Grim Reaper Lures, Spinnerbaits, and Bucktails. Call them at 610-593-2492 or look them up on the internet at GrimReaperLures.com. Hi everyone, Bob Mesa over here. Hey, you got a question. What's the hottest thing in your boat during prime musky conditions? If you're like me, it's Grant Big Dog Rods. Talk to the big dog himself. Call him at 847-577-0848. Hi everyone, Bob Masacomer here. Hey, welcome to the show. Now I've got a unique logo up right now on our screen. It's not a logo you see very often here at Fish and Sticks, but it's the Bassmasters Elite Series logo. And the reason for that, well, I'll explain that in a minute. In 1967, Bassmasters was formed by a gentleman by the name of Ray Scott. Ray Scott has brought us many, many things over the bass fishing world since his conception of Bassmasters, if you will. And part of that is the Bassmaster Elite Series. We are going to tonight get into the head of one of those great anglers that participates on this series. And I really, really am excited to introduce you folks to probably the best bass fisherman I know this side of, well, he's just one of the best I know. That's the easiest way to put it. Let's bring on Buddy Gross. Buddy, you there? Yes, sir, I am. Thank you for having me. Oh, buddy, it's our pleasure to have you for sure. Um, just talking a little bit to you about you and with you prior to the show, you've got a, a very interesting livelihood, an interesting career, and an interesting history. Let's start off with telling the folks where Buddy comes from. Buddy, where is home? Tell us a little bit about Buddy. I was born and raised right here around Chickamauga, Georgia, which is about... 15 miles south of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and it's the headwaters of Chattanooga or Chickamauga Creek, which actually formed where it runs into the Tennessee River at the Chickamauga Dam. So Chickamauga Lake, Nigga Jack Lake, and Gunnersville Lake are all three lakes of the Tennessee River that are within 45 minutes of my house. And you've been able to do what a lot of people haven't been able to do, and that's unmask a pretty serious arsenal of of sponsors and what have you going forward and that's really cool to see that um to know you're doing that and know what's happening but i want to get into buddy's life i want to get in and we're going to talk about your sponsors before we get too far along here but you have an interesting history let's talk a little bit about your history uh you know bass fishing for me i started off as a, a team angler with my friends after my dad decided that I worked too hard for him. I mean, he, he had me as a kid and loved it. And, uh, I just, I kind of moved a little bit faster than what he wanted to move. So I started fishing with friends and, uh, graduated into BFLs and did that for a while. And, you know, life kind of changed. I got out of fishing for a little bit. And then when I dove back in, I dove straight into the series and qualified for the tour and, went from the tour to the leaks now so it's kind of happened fast for me as far as professional fishing well you like you said you lived uh on or near chickamauga um which gave you a really interesting feel for it you you have a wife her name is leanne 14 year old son and you also have bella who is your 11 year old daughter um that's got to be really 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 kind of a pleasure for you to know that these young people and your wife are getting a chance to see you succeed in the world of bass fishing yeah when i married my wife 12 and a half years ago she said uh you know she didn't know nothing about tournament fishing i told her one day i was like that's time for me to get back into fishing she thought we was gonna go get a cricket and drown it on the bank and i come home with a boat and a, and a full schedule of tournaments and she didn't know what to think so she got educated pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, that would get you. Would get you definitely in the in the in the groove of things. Um, you you and I talked a little bit uh, before going on the show, and you told me a little bit about your dad. Your dad bought you your first bait caster, I believe, on the way home from a lake. Yeah, we had actually went up to Chickamauga Lake, and we were standing on the bank, and I think at the time. 
I was using an old Johnson reel. Anybody that remembers the old reels that were green, like an open face, but it was a step above like a Zebco or something. It was pretty neat. They would throw pretty good, but I had stood on the bank with a spinner bait, and it was, I remember, it, like it's yesterday, the water was on a drawdown, so it would have been in the fall, and uh, I caught a monster on a spinner bait. It was like a four and a half pounder, and my reel tore up, and they weren't no, they weren't paying me any attention, and the next thing you know, it, I backed up on the bank with that thing with a broke reel and a four pounder in my hand. Oh no, seriously? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, from the, we were standing at a boat ramp, and uh, we left the boat ramp, and I, it seems like it's like a half a mile, but it's probably two miles. But right up the road was the best tackle store at the time. I never forget it. it was a place called Big K Tackle on Highway 58. And uh, we walked in there, and he bought me my first bait caster reel, and I was probably eight seven eight years old and and he actually when he bought me one he bought my buddy one too cause he was <laughs> my buddy still got his original one i don't have the original one but i got one just like it you but, wore it you wore it out didn't you yeah, yeah i think i did <laughs> i've hey. tried to beat him out of his because it was bought the same day but he won't give it up you were telling me your parents kept a cabin cruiser in lake chickamauga which gave you an opportunity to get out there and do some crazy things but tell me about the batteries tell me a little bit that was an interesting interesting story that we had talking about the batteries yeah my parents were had a, a, a crew little, when i say a cabin cruiser, a little bitty cabin cruiser it's probably like a 25 foot back then i mean it was a fiber form boat and and they had it on the old wooden docks you know that is part of the state park and it's been there forever it's probably since the lake was built but uh they were one of the end docks so uh i got my dad to get me a flat bottom boat and i had i had restrictions there's a no weight thing it was like a big pocket you know and I could go from the no-wake buoys anywhere I wanted to, as long as I stayed in that pocket. And he would give me four trolling motor batteries, which was out of a big truck. So I had 18-wheeler batteries, and I'd burn them things down. <laughs> uh, I'd run two of them as far as I could go, and then I'd swap over to the other two. So, But I, I was very fortunate. I got to stay on the water about as much as I wanted to and, and had no idea I was going to end up doing this. It was always kind of a a dream that you never talked about and, and it just happened and, and it's it's God's blessings all I can tell you. I think that's the reality of what does happen. You also you also um when you were about fifteen your father bought your first Stratus two oh one. Now before you answer this, I had Stratus for a TV sponsor for a while, so I'm very aware of the two oh one with a two twenty five horsepower. That's a lot of boat for a fifteen year old. Now, hang on, man. He bought it for us to use. I never. He wasn't like these days. These these kids today's got it made. Right? I was a uh, I was a full blown boy. Now I was. Uh, I think he was scared to turn me loose in it. To be honest with you, I do. We had a great boat. I remember I had the venom on it, and I had to learn how to drive it. I mean, my dad was very good about letting me experience everything. So. And I hate that he's not here to enjoy where I'm at now. I really wish he could see it. Well, you know, he's done a lot for you, and he is here to see it. He's looking down upon you, and he's very proud of what you're doing. Uh, and there's, there's, you can't take that away no matter who you are or what you are. It's kind of funny you talk about young people in boats. I had a uh, Hydrosport, a VO485, with a Mod VP on the back of it, and... We were up to our resort one day, and my my oldest son says to me, Dad, I want to go fishing. To make a long story short, I said, well, fish off the dock. And I walked in the house, and my mom says to me, she says, don't you break that kid's spirit. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, you let that kid take that boat. I said, Ma, Ma, it's an 80-mile-an-hour boat. He's not going to get in that boat. You let that kid take that boat. So we went down to the dock, and we had a little conversation, and uh, he got to take the boat. And he was... Uh, oh, he's, no. He's never looked back. I mean, it really, it really was a good deal for him. So after I, I got, I got to take mine out in high school, but it was very limited and very, probably very chaperoned close by. But it was very, very, very controlled environment. <laughs> well, let's talk about that graduation that you did uh, and how that moved you in and what started happening in the late, early nineties. Uh, you know, the early 90s, I didn't, I graduated high school in 91. So in 91, I kind of got out of fishing for a while. And then, you know, when I was in my mid twenties, I got back into fishing a little derby with a buddy of mine. And it just, once I did that, 
I got a taste of the derby stuff. It, it sparked an interest that has never died. And you, you had an opportunity too, um, if I'm not mistaken, to spend a little bit more time in the boat with your dad at the same time. And uh, you picked up a big thing in 2008. I mean, let's be honest about it. That's a really big thing when that happens to you in 2008. You got married. <laughs> yes, I did. And it wasn't long after that I had a little girl, and man, it's just been it's just been special. I mean, I don't think I grew up till my little girl was born. To be honest with you, my son is a stepson, and uh, you know, I, he was three when we when we married, and and uh, my, my daughter slowed me down, and it made me focus <laughs> on things more, and it, it was it, it's just been a blessing, man. I can't tell you how, how blessed we've been since we all got together. It's been one of the best things that ever happened to me. No, it's really it really is a pretty cool deal. So let's move forward. Let's move forward into 2015, and let's start talking about the serious side of Buddy Gross. Well, 2015, I was working at the family-owned body shop here as a general manager, and I decided I wanted to jump into the Costas just to see if I could make some money slash had really no goal of trying to qualify for the tour and but looked up first event i had a good finish second event i had a good finish third event i had a good finish and i think i finished don't hold me to this fourth fifth sixth in the points and uh, that qualified me for the tour because then they took 10. <laughs> and, uh, i qualified for the tour and then the family business kind of changed in the spring of that year and and i knew it was coming to an end so my wife and I were at home one night talking, and she says, well, you just qualified for the tour. I guess you could try fishing for a living, and we didn't have two nickels rubbed together to speak of. I mean, we didn't have no money, and we lived a lot by faith, and I said, well, we could just try to see if we can come up with a few sponsors to see if we can make it still happen, and we came up with $5,000 before you knew it, and the next thing we know, we had 10000 and we made a run at it. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> well, you... Had, you you spent a lot of time during that period too developing technique and that technique has carried with you over the years um you've got you know finesse backgrounds you've got flipping you know slinging swim baits crank baits you have basically do it all but we're going to get into the meat of what you do to win as we move forward here tonight but you are a multi-talented angler and you like to fish everything from shore to depth and that is to me that's an awesome situation to be in it really is i just i i'm self-taught more or less my dad was a guy who liked to drag carolina rig around my best friend he just kind of let me do my thing and 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 i can tell you that i have been behind in this sport of professional fishing because most of the guys i'm fishing with co-angled for multiple years and 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 had had a good head start on me so Fortunately, I've had some good travel partners who were not stingy with information as far as getting me going on the right path to figure out the finesse side because I can power fish pretty good. But you start going to lakes you've never been, it, it opens up a whole other box of things you have to learn. You have to learn fast how to break down water. You have to learn fast how to manage fish. And, and again, it's been a blessing as much as I can tell you anything. It's nothing that, that I can tell you that I do. It just kind of comes to me. Well, you've done a good job at it. After finishing six in the Eastern Open on Florida's Harris Chain and the third in the second Open at Lake Chickamauga, your focus changed dramatically. Yes, it did. I, at that point, I knew I was sitting, I think I was actually second in the points after that one and sitting good, but we were going to the James River and tidal water. I've only done one, one time before that. You know, I didn't have a great finish at the James River, but what I did do was I'm going to learn a lot. I learned a whole lot, and I didn't fall so far back. I think I had a, a high 50 or a low 60 finish, and it still kept me in the hunt. But what I did do is I learned a lot about barnacles, and I learned a lot about tides. And, and uh, I was up there fishing dirty water with 10-pound test drop shots, and barnacles was taking me to school. So <laughs> I had some opportunities. I mean, I legitimately... I probably could have made a cut in that one if I had known and had been in that position before. So that was another lesson learned. And 
I left that tournament knowing that I had to go to Oneida and have a good performance. And I got my first top 20 up north and qualified for the Leafs. And it was incredible. It was a nail biter, but I made it. You know, people don't realize it. Um, you have to be a seasoned angler and you have to have some some whereabouts in the travel world with you to, to succeed. A lot of people network anglers. A lot of people get information from a lot of other anglers as they go in and out. But you didn't have that network in place. So you had to go up and literally pay your dues to make it all happen. And that's that to me that's impressive that's what we did when we did our tv show around the years for more than 35 years around the country we went into different water all the time and had to pick up on the nuances and what have you and you seem to have successfully done that very nicely i think the biggest i can attribute that the biggest thing to is i've always liked fishing structure i've always been a guy whether it's on the bank or offshore i always look for something a little different and I can attribute that to my Humminbird Electronics and being able to look at it and actually find the structure I was looking for because fish is a fish all over the country. They're going to hang on to the same kind of stuff pretty much everywhere we go. So uh, if I can tell you electronics and being able to scan like we do nowadays makes yeah. it better for somebody like me who wants to fish that type of scope, you know, that type of fish. And we're going to get into that right after the commercial break because that is key. And we're going to drill down on what Buddy does, what he does different, and how he makes some of these determinations. One thing being said, um, in, oh, let's see, I got, there we go. Um, <clears throat> in your past, you competed in the 2019 Bassmasters Eastern Open. And at that point, you had already decided to make a professional angling career out of this and you had stacked up nearly four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in wins on the tours that being said where does buddy stand today in terms of that of that big money roll well you know we we just had a really 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 good event at the first one in the elites i guess is where you're asking me but i finished 11th at the john's and then come back up and i had a a win at eufaula so I'm on, I mean, the momentum's with me. I mean, it, I don't know what else to say. I don't know how it's happening. Or I've never been to either one of those fish before this year. We, we've just been able to put it together, and uh, it's working out. I think one of the cool things that you told me is when this all started and you started fishing the openings, your incentive was to cash checks for the family. You yep. literally made it a decision to make it a living. And that, that's kind of where I was going with that, because in order to survive fishing professional tournaments, you have to have sponsor support, which you're gaining. But you also have to have a bankroll. And that bankroll, you earn. And you earn it by winning tournaments. And that's that, to me, is a big deal. It, it I couldn't do it without that. I mean, like, you know, the only year that I've had a year that I wouldn't say was, and it was successful, so don't get me wrong, but... Uh, so this is 20 so 18 was my hardest year by far uh and you know 16 started off rough but i did win one my first year in flw tour so you know 16 16's win kind of got me back square where i didn't you know i wasn't running on borrowed money and all that stuff but it still wasn't enough to set you up so we left 16 went to 17 i didn't win a professional tournament in I guess 17, I won, or I said professional, I won a Costa down at Seminole in 17. 18, I didn't do good. 19, I had another win at Toho. So, and then this year having this win, we're so close. If I could just have a really good year this year, get everything put back where it needs to be, and I, I think I can make this a long-term deal. But, you know, I've been oh, scared. I'm pretty sure. Year. I'm pretty sure you're going to make a long-term deal. We're going to hold Buddy over to the commercial, folks, and be right back. We're going to have a lot more coming up. One Bob Mason Buddy talks here. to us. Hey, got a question. What's the hottest thing in your boat during prime musky conditions? If you're like me, it's Grant Big Dog Rods. Talk to the big dog himself. Call him at 847-577-577. 0848. Don't let your lack of success be the death of your fishing. Check out Grim Reaper Lures, Spinnerbaits, and Bucktails. Call them at 610-593-2492 or look them up on the internet at GrimReaperLures.com. 
Buddy, I want to come out of this commercial with a piece of footage that we've got that I find amazing. Now, we're going to watch this. We'll probably see it again toward the end, but it's you fishing your home lake. And we've got audio attached to it, so we'll sit back for about four minutes here, watch what we've got. And then we're going to discuss this before we go on here tonight. But I want folks to see the way you fish and the technique you use when you fish because that is critical. Sir. Now, this is actually during a tournament, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Now, I want to ask you something. How's the net job doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you something, I think I'm better off without a net over the bass because I make that net job look awful everywhere I've ever been. I don't want you as a musky partner. <laughs> no, no, if it's a team deal, I do great. But if I just can't clean the net, I'm, I'm, I really and truly have been so used to dragging them fast to the boat and my partner's netting them, I forgot how to do it sometimes. But if I drop the net in the lake, it's usually a good tournament because it's, usually, it's been a win two times in a row. Oh, my goodness. That being said... <laughs> Hey, folks, now that that's Buddy at his best. I gotta tell you, we I, I've had this situation myself more than once, and it's funny. But let me ask you a question: uh, FLWs allow nets. The Bassmasters Elite does not. Which do you really prefer? I'd still rather have a net, but you see my net <laughs> skills. I might be better off without it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw a little bit of your net skills for sure. We're gonna go through a bunch of just images right now that are background footage. Uh, it's just stuff. It's you. It's your family. It's all this kind of stuff. Uh, and as while we're doing that, let's talk a little bit about the buildup to the tournament you just won. Because that's where we're going at the end of the day. We're going to Yafala, Alabama. It it was just one of those deals. I I had went down and pre practice. Uh, we had you know with the, with the COVID, we had time to get a little bit of fishing in you know before the tournament come around. And I went down and the lake had a history of doing really good on offshore structure. And I went down and idled and idled and idled and. I think I was down for a day and a half, and both times I went, it was flooding. It was two feet out of the bank, and and I'm pretty sure that the water was worse than coffee. It's chocolate milk. It was awful. And and all I did is idle around and look, and uh, Mark structure, Mark brush left the first time in a day and a half. I think I found 280 waypoints, and uh, I come home and. Uh, said you know i know i know where to start each place so i went back during official practice and i idled some more i wound up with like 500 spots to fish and you can't fish 500 spots in three weeks much less three days so <laughs> i just the first day of practice i was the first one on the lake and uh we get to go out 30 minutes before sunrise which it was a cloudy rainy day so that was pretty early so i went out idled a few of them in the depth i thought i want to start on and seen some fish on the screen so the first day of practice, I actually made probably 15 casts, and I caught three good ones, and I never stopped idling the rest of the time. I'd stop just to make a cast to break the monotony, but mostly all I did was find places I was going to fish during the tournament because I pretty much knew what I was going to do, and, and I stuck with that game plan, and it, and it paid off. Wow. Well, let's talk about the game plan for just a wee bit. Now, when you're a bass fishing, especially a tournament pro, you have all the options from shallow to deep. You are really noted as an offshore fisherman. Now, what that means to our, our listening and viewing audience is you're fishing substructures. You're fishing stuff that's not directly connected to the shoreline in terms of, say, 10 foot or less. You've chosen to isolate your presentations on very isolated structures themselves. Shoreline fishermen, read me if I'm wrong here. Shoreline fishermen who go in and depend on the shoreline, 
They're set with a number of different situations. If they get a cold front, those shallow water fish are pounded pretty hard, in, meaning they physiologically shut down. You've got l weekend anglers. You've got other anglers who pound those shorelines every day. You as an angler that's offshore, that get a chance to get out and fish that deeper water, you're fishing a society of fish, in my opinion, that's a lot less pressured. Would you read into that? I agree 100%, but technology's changing that aspect, and, and I'm learning that a lot. Oh, yeah. I'm still fishing offshore. I'm still catching fish offshore, but I'm telling you, in the near future, it's going to be a 50-50 game. We're going to have to use shorelines, and we're going to have to use offshore just because anglers are getting better. These younger guys are knowing our electronics. Map cards are getting better. I mean, just all of our technology is coming together that makes fish – have a whole lot more pressure on them everywhere not not just on the banks now so offshore fish used to be kind of a sacred place because they didn't see as much but that's not the case anymore but i was just blessed with being able to kind of read underwater contours and kind of know what i'm looking at even though it's underwater I, I can tell you i'm gonna give away a secret here i probably shouldn't but i grew up in the <laughs> farm area so and, and, you know, when I was a kid, they talked about flooding this big valley I live in and making a, a, a power lake out of it years ago. I mean, this is before I was born. And I used to ride down through there and think, man, if they flooded this, that creek channel band right there would have been a great place. Or this, that hump in the middle of that field is all by itself. That would have been where they was at. So I just took me riding down the road looking at pasture land, and I can convert that into what I'm seeing underwater. And, and it's helped me tremendously figure out how to locate fish. I, and that was something I did all my high school years and all my you know, 20s and 30s every time i was driving down the road i was looking in the pasture to see what the land laid like so i could understand it when i looked at it on a graph you know i'd be honest with you we do very much the same thing um from a musky perspective and i fish bass too you, you don't know this but i have a history of some bass fishing as well uh so so i totally agree with what you're saying but that being said there's people like David Fritz who go out and pull that deep water fish up on crankbaits. And you know how to throw crankbaits. And you do a very good job at it. You started out fishing at Eufaula with crankbaits. Am I right? I actually started out with swim baits. I had, I had come up with a way to swim bait that I could throw through the brush piles. Well, I, I mean, you're exactly right. I started on a school the first day because in practice... I found a pretty big scope, and uh, when I got there, somebody else was on it, and it was Brandon Cobb, and I pulled up, and Brandon let me go in there with him, and we were throwing, I was throwing a crankbait, he's throwing a spoon, we were throwing several different things, just trying to keep this scope fired up, and, and yes, I had an opportunity for a giant that first morning on a crankbait, but that scope got busted up and didn't last into the second day. Now, do you find when you when you're pulling your crankbaits do you find a huge variance between the square lip crankbaits and the round lip or the longer round lip crankbaits as far as how they produce and how they go through the timber and anything like that oh yeah square bills are going to deflect better they have a wider wobble and i do like those when the water room warms up more i like a tighter swimming bait whenever it's cooler temperatures but the round lip stuff is what you have to use to get the depth that we needed because we were throwing it, you know, 16, 17, 18 feet of water and making really long casts. Everything I did at this tournament consisted of me making long casts so the fish were less aware of me being there. So it made a big difference with those long casts. We have a picture of Every time I watch video of you, Every time Absolute. you whistle a lure off of that rod tip, you have no problem sending it to the next zip code. And that that's an important factor when you talk about not only being able to reach fish further from the boat, but reach fish that aren't being pressured by your presence. Because these fish have got lateral lines, they're sensitive, they know what's going on, and it's a huge game changer when you can make those monster long casts. It has very much been a benefit of me for years. For whatever reason, I just muscle through and I throw a lot of stiffer rods than most people in order for me to get these longer casts. And and a lot of times people ask me how come I'm fighting the fish the way I do. Well, I'm using probably non-politically correct rods as far as I use a more of a flipping stick style with a deep crankbait instead of a, a glass rod like Fritz has taught us. And, yep, yep. Uh, on my jig that you see me i was using the extra heavy with a light wire hook i just do things a lot different i want good hook penetration 
because I'm throwing so far. And when I'm throwing, and, and, it, and it don't sound possible, but I throw 20, 30, maybe 40 yards more than most people that are around me. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm watching your videos, and you do. I mean, that thing comes off the rod tip like a missile. I'm very much like you in the fact that I fish heavier rods than most people do as well. I noticed with your hook set, if we go back, if we go back and, and take a look at the hook set, the sweeping hook set that you make, I'm going back to a piece of footage that we just showed. And this is a sweeping hook set. I'm just going to use a second of it here because you don't have, for the. I mean, when you get that jig on, it's a different story. But when you're crankbaiting and you set the hook, all you're doing apparently, and it's basically the same thing I think I do, is you roll back into it right there. You load the rod, and once that rod's loaded, what you seem to do is just stay in contact with the fish. Yep. I tried not to ever let my rod do as much of the fighting as I want. The tension on the line and my real presence to tell me what the fish is fixing to do because you know when i first started fishing crankbaits and stuff and i'm talking about years ago i'd throw it out there and i'd be hooked up to the side of me and the fish would be again these long casts i'm making would jump and there's nothing i could do about it when it jumped i had no tension on my rod other than the tension that the rod had itself so long cast line was stretching more rods was giving more and I just learned that I started aiming rods at them too, and when the fish would jump, I could drag it to me to keep the slack from getting in my line. So it's, it, it is kind of like, uh, I, I don't know if you ever remember the movie, A River Runs Through It, had Brad Pitt learning how to fly fishes on yep. it. It's kind of just something that I've I've done on my own, and, and people that ask me about it are in the boat with me, and I'll teach them, and, and they like it. it it's, but it is not, what do you call it? It's not what everybody's doing. I'm, I'm kind of going my own path to that. And, and sometimes it it bites me, but sometimes it don't. <laughs> no, you're you're you know you're definitely you're breaking the norms. You know, I stand at sports shows and I still speak at sports shows around the country, as I suppose you do too. And people will ask that question: What do you like in an action of a rod? What do you like in the length of a rod? And of course, it's like a golfer carrying golf clubs. You have to have more than one. But when I get out to my crankbait rods, I like a lot more powerful rod than say the standard public does and I, I think it's advantageous now that being said when you hook up on them you can't bulldog them you gotta feel the fish which is what you're saying right you know i could tell you something else too because you know i started crankbait fishing when the only crankbait we had other that would go deeper than a you know a normal's dd22 was a man's 30 plus i mean that's a long time ago yep and and a man's 30 plus felt like you're dragging a mac truck across the bottom of the lake and uh so I started learning how to take these Betty 22s and make them go deeper because of the drag. And when you're throwing them all day, you don't think it means a lot, but it does. So we started doing the nail and reel, you know, get down on your knees, stick your rod all the way to the reel and, yep. and trying to get the depth. But what I did learn is even when I was doing that with a, with a glass rod or a flimsy rod, the rod would bow up towards the water surface and I'd be down on my knees, but it'd still be six inches under the surface at best. So, with a stiff rod, I could stand up, hold the rod down in the water, and I'm getting deeper than I was before. Just, so, you know, there's been a lot of reasons we've tried, we've tried that, but it's just been something that works for me. Just a curious question. Uh, for cranking, what's your favorite line test? What do you choose on most of your crankbait rods? And I know that'll vary from location to location, but just as a general rule, where do you try to I, focus? I'm and, and you've seen my cast, so I used to try to do 10 for depth reasons, but I mm -hmm. break 10 on the cast i would break it and i'd send my crankbaits to, to the best but i wound up settling in on my bigger crankbaits i'm throwing 15 and now my small crankbaits i throw 12 now i'm not telling you i won't drop down if i have to but typically all my small crankbaits like 10 foot or less are on 12 and anything over that's 15. yeah i i i i, I couldn't i couldn't agree with you more uh some of it depends on water clarity and the depth you have to achieve but i find 14 to be comfortable i'll upsize my bait with a bigger lip and accomplish the same thing and i think you're doing basically that that's exactly right and my cast is making up for when you're casting 30 40 yards more than than i'm getting more bottom contact just because of my cast distance 
Absolutely. In a second, we're going to talk about body can contact here, folks. This is the Bassmasters Elite Special we're talking right now with Buddy Gross, folks. We're going to be right back after this commercial break because there's a lot more coming from this young man. Trust me when I say that. Hi, everyone. Bob Mason coming here. Don't let your lack of success be the death of your fishing. Check out Grim Reaper Lures, Spinnerbaits, and Bucktails. Call them at 610-593-2492 or look them up on the internet at GrimReaperLures.com. Hi everyone, Bob Mason from over here. Hey, you got a question. What's the hottest thing in your boat during prime musky conditions? If you're like me, it's Grant Big Dog Rods. Talk to the big dog himself. Call him at 847-577-0848. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. Hey, we're going to be talking a little bit about what Buddy does beneath the surface and how we get there. He alluded to it earlier on in the show. <laughs> Buddy, let's talk a little bit about your electronics, okay? Because I know you're a firm believer in what they can do for you. Yes, sir. I'm running uh, Hummingbird Helix 12s, and, uh, you know, every, everything now we have is the Mega. I got Mega down, Mega side, and... And my biggest key for the way I like to fish, and, and the cat's out of the bag now, it's not like, you know, I, it's one of those things we tried to keep a secret as long as we could, but we can't. But but the Mega 360 is hands down my biggest tool for, for fishing structure. It, it gives me an opportunity to see targets fish in the structure as well as the target itself, which is whatever, if it's a if it's a, a grass patch or if it's a brush pile or if it's a rock pile or if it's a, you know, even a break on a ledge, a straight break, I can just see everything I need to see with the 360. It's not a live view, but I'm after, I'm more after what structure's there and what fish are around it instead of whether they're following me in. But, but again, I, it's just working for me, and uh, I feel like I was behind without it, and now that I have it, I don't ever want to be without it. We're going to take a couple of minutes here. We're going to watch a piece with Tommy Sanders, in Mark Zona, the big Z over at Bassmasters, is they break down you during this tournament in Fiala, Alabama. Because, folks, there's a lot to be said for the type of technique that one uses, and Buddy does a really good job at it. That's a daggum nine pipe. <laughs> Might be a 10 pounder. What? Hold on. Oh, Lord. Wow. Quit that. Quit it. This is a whole new game now. Party just got a little louder. Wow, wow, wow. wow. Man, man. He's 6'3", back at Canterbury, and he's got a two-pounder in his mm -hmm. limit. Yeah. <gasps> back on. Hold on a minute. Wheelhouse. Boys better catch him. God, there it is. That's a big one. That's what I was going to tell you. They've just been biting here all week. He was barely hooked. That's a good one. That's going to be a good tool. Going to have to catch some giants. Here's Buddy Gross. She's big. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
Stay on there, baby. Stay on there, baby. Stay on there, baby. Oh, it grows currently a pound and a half. That's a big one. Behind Scott Canterbury. That's like a grown. This is a three pounder. Anything over three. Open your mouth. Pull him closer. Woo! He's got it. Oh, oh that wow. is a good one. That's it. That's the biggest bag of the tournament right I, here. I cannot yeah. believe this. Look it's... at the size of that thing. Uh, that's our fourth lead change of the that's day. Our... Wow. We have a picture of that jig. We need to take a peek at it here when things slow down again. But the absolute Buddy, I'm here to tell you, man. Tommy Sanders has been announcing for Bassmasters since I can remember. He might be the original. I don't know. But the truth of the matter is, is Mark Zona is no pushover either. He's a tournament professional, and you got their attention. Holy smokes, Rocky. I'm t what, is, what does it feel like? What does it feel like in an event like this to basically come from behind? Because that's what Buddy Gross did. He came from behind. 10th place and walked up the leaderboard and that being said what does it feel like to pull up to your first spot or your second spot or whatever the case may be and boom pop these monster fish on honest again this that morning i told my marshal i was like look it's gonna be boring until about 10 30 11 o'clock because i haven't been getting really any quality bites before that i would start out running all new water and we started out that morning and went to the first spot didn't get a bite. Second spot, I lost like a three or four pounder. Second spot, or the very next spot, I lost another about three pounds. I was like, man, I hope this ain't gonna be the way the day's gonna go. And uh, I was like, look, this ain't, this is not where I've been happening. Let's just go down in the area I've been fishing. And we pulled up down there, and it was about 9, 45, 10 o'clock. I made my first cast on the shallow brush, and I caught a good one. I was like, well, this is what, this, this is good. This is what we need to be doing. And and the next thing, it just started rolling. And once it started rolling, I really wasn't thinking about it until the camera boat showed back up. Because I, I didn't have nobody with me until, you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I was like, well, I mean, we must be doing something good. I've been some enough tournaments to know that if the camera boat shows up, something's happening. So I just kept digging. And before you know it, I had a whole bunch of people watching. I had boats around me. And I had uh, spectators. And I had cameramen and still photographers. And I was like, Something, something's happening here. This, yeah, this, yeah. This something's, going on. So, 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 something's happening. Casey and I, I was. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. I was just going to say, at that point, I'm probably looking at like, you know, we got a chance. So I started really burning down when I seen nobody leaving and it's starting to get later in the day and, and we just made it happen. Well, I got news for you. Casey and I were watching this event unfold. And literally, we chimed in on the comment section and asked you to come on the show while you were on the water catching these <laughs> monster fish. Now, let's get into the secret sauce, okay? You went to the water and pulled out a deadly jig. Tell us a little bit about this jig. It, it's a jig that uh, one of my good friends here at home, he actually owns the Boat Logics, which is, is the, one of my big sponsors and also a... Uh, it's an electronic graph mounting system, and, and they've got some, some cool products. But he has been a fishing friend of mine and a, a, a team partner of mine, and, and we just, if I ever, he's got, a I guess, a mechanical engineering background. But anyway, he he's pretty slick. So if I come up with something, we can make it. I mean, it, even if, it's, if we don't have a mold and I want it, he can make the mold. So it, it's been a great tool to have, but we sit, and I just told him, I was like, look, I was like, my rods stow further, my lines stretches a little more than the old days, my rods, you know, everything is just, I'm just not liking the penetration I'm getting with jigs because I have a lot of fish come to the top, open their mouth, and my jig's coming out. So I started working on a jig with a lightweight guard, a lighter wire hook. It's not a light wire hook, so don't misunderstand me when I tell you that because you can see my hook sets. They're not for the faint of heart, and, and I'm throwing 17-pound line and an extra heavy rod. So... It's just a good penetrating hook, and uh, it was more of a grass head. It just comes through the brush good, and the, the fish were keying on brim. I know what the feel was, because I've seen shellcracker beds around these brush piles, not all of them, some of them, 
and, and I started seeing the shell crackers show up on the beds. I could actually see them on my 360. I could see shell crackers in the bed. And, and I it, don't I don't want to take all the credit for it, I promise you. I've been throwing a worm and a swim bait. I throw my worm, and I can't tell you why. My line broke, and that worm left here. And I didn't want to sit down and re because I was on a good place, and I had a jig laying there. I picked my jig up, threw that thing out there. I don't even think it hit the bottom. Boom, bite, big one. Next thing I know, I throw it back out there. I mean, like, I caught 14 out of one brush pile at one time. 14 bites out of one brush pile. And I knew then, because I had not done that before I picked the jig up, I knew then I was on the right bait, and I just ran with it. Yeah, I'll say you're on the right bait. That's the kind of day everybody prays for. You turned around and put that jig down in that timber. And we were showing there, uh, during your conversation, we were showing your down scan. So you were able to see the fish on your on your system, both in the 360 and in the down scan. You would focus your attention on exactly where you needed to make that cast. You knew your boat position, and you were able to go down, look at it, and be representative of where you needed to make that cast. And like you said, that lure didn't hardly hit the bottom, and it got chowed. Yep, it was uh, it was a right bait for the for the day that we were fishing, and and it just progressively got better and not worse the bite got better for me instead of worse but you know i i think the first day i should have had a great big bag on other things but it, it was unpressured fish it was the first day of the tournament but it got tougher every day so i had to reinvent it and and when i got lucky enough to find that that deal they just chomped on it so with that being said where is buddy headed next well we hope we're headed north. I mean, you know, with the COVID and, and all of us trying to fish smart and stuff and, and live smart, uh, we've not got a, a definite that we're going up north yet, but it looks like we're going to Cayuga next and uh, St. Lawrence and then into Champlain. Three back-to-back -back weeks starting in the 9th of July. So you're going to be pulling largemouth and smallmouth up there, but a huge population of smallies. What are you changing up different to be up there? Any idea? Uh, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to target more largemouth. I've always went up there and, and did the smallmouth thing, but, but I'm going to, I did get to go to Champlain. As soon as we got done at you fall, I come home, took a nap and we hauled butt up to uh, Champlain just to look at it. Cause I've never been down south. So I do know I'm going to look <laughs> at the largemouth this time, if, as long as the weather's permitting and we make it. Wow. But uh, I love smallmouth fishing. I'm going to tell you what I do enjoy being a Southern boy who never got to fish up North at all. When I get up north and I start catching them brown fish, I'm in like heaven. Them things bite. <laughs> they bite and they pull. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the guy that likes to bite and something to pull back. So. <laughs> You're in the right game. <laughs> yeah. I, I fell asleep in my chair in here every now and then to set the hook. Everybody jumps out of the pants. <laughs> pretty funny. Well, we're wishing you all the best there can possibly be. Um, but as we go out of here, though, there's something I want to post, and you're not going to be able to see it. Um, unfortunately, you're in a position where it's hard for you to see what we're doing right now. But the, but the image I have up, it says, what were the odds? What were the odds that Buddy would come in here and take the win? Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm here to tell you that Buddy Gross won the Lake Eufaula Bassmasters Elite Tournament, and he did it in super style. When you can make Mark Zona speechless and Tommy Sanders talking to himself, I'm telling you, you did something. Bassmasters has got to be very proud to have Buddy Gross in their midst because all these sports, no matter what they are, they need key players. They need the celebrities. They need the people who step outside of the norm and try something different. They need the people who step up when things get tough or don't put the rod down when things get brutal. And that's what I've learned from Buddy Gross in the short period of time I've had him. I, 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 my hat's off to you, young man, big time. Thank you very much, and it was so such a pleasure to be on your show, and I hope you invite me again sometime. Oh, you tell you what, you better let us know what happens up to the next two or three tournaments you fish, or I might be chasing you down. <laughs> I hope you're chasing me down because that means I did really good. There you go. We're gonna make we're gonna make some really good friendships going forward here. I I just admire the heck out of people that can do what you do, and it's amazing, buddy. With that being said, congratulations. 
congratulations on your huge win at Lake Eufaula, Alabama, and the monster 87 pound, 84 pound, eight ounce limit. That was a huge, huge weight. Um, geez, it was fun to watch. <laughs> God, God be with you. Drive careful. Get on the water safely. Pass on the good things to everybody you come in contact with. And you're a pleasure to have on the show, buddy. I super appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you again for having me. And uh, it was all my pleasure. And God bless everybody. Thank you. You bet. We've got your Instagram stuff up. It's Buddy Gross Fishing Instagram. We have your Facebook stuff up. It's Buddy Gross Fishing. So, folks, if you want to follow a phenomenal hook, and I mean phenomenal. I told Buddy when I was talking to him and we were doing pre-show prep, I told Buddy point blank, there's, I've seen nobody take a crankbait out and do what Buddy did uh, and win a tournament as much as David Fritz did. David Fritz has impressed me to no end. Denny Brower's another one that can do the same thing. Uh, you're in a league, buddy. You're in a league with some of the best in the world. Hats off to you. God bless you. We'll see you down the road. With that being said, folks, we're going to say goodbye, and we're going to listen to some things from our sponsors that make our show possible. We want to thank, I will, after the commercial break. I'm Bob Mason coming here. Don't let your lack of success be the death of your fishing. Check out Grim Reaper Lures, Cinnabates, and Bucktails. Call them at 610-593-2492, or look them up on the Internet at GrimReaperLures.com. Hi everyone, Bob Mason from over here. Hey, you got a question. What's the hottest thing in your boat during prime musky conditions? If you're like me, it's Grant Big Dog Rods. Talk to the big dog himself. Call him at 847-577-0848. Again, I want to say thanks to Bassmaster, the Bassmaster Elite Series. I want to say thanks to Tommy Sanders and Mark Zona. They do an incredible job at commentary on the Bassmaster series. If you folks don't watch this series, you should probably dial in. You know, I'm a musky fisherman. There's no doubt about it. I've got some bass background. But there's something to be learned from every angler that you come into contact with. Every single angler can teach you something. So many people will say, well, I don't fish bass. Well, you fish, don't you? There's something to learn from every species fisherman there is out there. And that's what 5 at 5 Live is for, is to try to bring these people to the forefront and teach you a little bit more than you might have known when we started. This was kind of a, just a fun show to get to know Buddy Gross. I think when he comes out of New York and some of these other tournaments, we're going to get to know Buddy Gross even more. I, I just I believe in my heart of hearts, folks that we have not seen the end of Buddy Gross. This is Bob Mesocomer saying thanks for watching and remember one thing, pass it on. What you learn, teach somebody else. We'll see you next week for more 5 at 5 Live.